Okay, I think we'll uh, get started. Welcome everyone to the presentation. I'm really glad that you can join us for this important topic. My name is Shannon McNulty. I'm an estate planning lawyer in New York City, and the main focus of my practice is helping families with young children uh, who have international issues in their planning. So before we start, I'd like to, if you could indulge me in taking a quick poll. Um, I'm gonna launch this, we'll see how this works. And just, if you can just indicate where, what type of visa situation you have that will help me in guiding me uh, in this pr presentation so I can make sure I'm addressing everyone's uh, situation. Okay, great. Okay, that looks like we got a, a lot of uh, feedback now. Um, a lot of people here uh, are U.S. citizens, but I assume there's some kind of international connection. Uh, a lot of people who are permanent residents, and then we have a few as well who are here on a temporary work visa. And that's probably a pretty good reflection of what, my, uh, what I find in terms of my clients who I work with. So just a quick, before we get started, I just have to give a quick disclaimer that this presentation is just for informational and educational purposes. Um, and for your particular situation, you should retain a lawyer to provide you with individualized advice. Um, and also any tax advice uh, should not be relied upon that is given in this, uh, in this presentation. So this presentation is, targeted towards international families, and they assume that that's why you're here. So that means um, one or both of the parents in the family is not a U.S. citizen. Uh, maybe close family members live outside of the U.S., or perhaps you are U.S. citizens, but you own assets outside of the U.S. In any of these cases, um, we would consider there to be some kind of international concern when we're doing your planning. So um, my goal for this webinar is to make sure because when we do have international issues in the planning process, uh, it can really cause some problems um, and a lot of complications, particularly if you don't do the planning or if you don't do it correctly. So my goal is to, for you to learn how to save your family from a bureaucratic nightmare, because that's really what it can be when we have complications and there is an unexpected death, unexpected incapacity, and no planning has been done. So when we talk about estate planning, what I think about it is you're creating a safety net for your family. So we can't always prevent a fall, we can't always prevent a tragedy, none of us are completely immune. Um, but we can make it less devastating for our loved ones if tragedy does occur. And I think that, you know, if we haven't learned anything from this year, it's that we cannot um, foresee the future and unpredictable things happen. And so it's really important to put some planning in place uh, beforehand so that we can make that effect less dramatic or less devastating. So the main uh, aspects of estate planning, which I'll be addressing here, are who will take care of your kids, uh, who will manage your assets, and then we'll talk about the key documents that it's important to have in your planning. And then I'll also talk about some common tax traps for, um, for those with any kind of international connections. So the first topic is who would take care of your children if you couldn't? And this is always the most important thing that we do in estate planning. Um, you know, certainly it's important to make sure there's enough money, we want to avoid taxes, but nothing is more important than who is taking care of your child on a day-to-day -day basis because that's something that money simply cannot compensate for. So how is an, a guardian, and a guardian is the person who is appointed if there is no parent um, who is able to care for the child. Um, a guardian in general, they are named in the will. Uh, a guardian must be appointed by the court. So even if 
a guardian is named in the will, they still must be appointed by the court. The, in most cases, uh, the person who is named in the will will be appointed as by the court because the, the court really weighs heavily what the wishes of the parents are and what the parents think would be in the best interest of the child. But the overall standard, the overriding standard that the court is going to look at is what is in the best interest of the child. So regardless of who is named in the will, the court always wants to make sure that it's in the best interest of a child. Uh, because the, sometimes things might come out that the parents didn't know about at the time they did their will, circumstances might, might have changed. So, you know, in, in most cases we're, we're looking at, they would only be excluded if there was uh, some kind of criminal history, uh, substance abuse, things like that. But if there's a contest, um, if more than one person is petitioning to be the guardian, then the, the court is going to just weigh and look at what, what would be the best for the child. If there's, nobody, uh, if there's nobody indicated in the will, if there is no will, then someone else can petition to be the guardian of the child and the court will entertain any, uh, any petitions to be the child's guardian. So one of the most common concerns of my clients is uh, naming a family member of their, uh, for their child who would serve as the guardian. And this is because often we don't have, if you, have, if you are here um, as an immigrant, you don't necessarily have a lot of close family members in the US. And so the best people to take care of your child may be outside of the US. Um, so that does present a wrinkle in the planning in terms of the guardianship appointment. It is possible a U.S. court can appoint a foreign guardian. And the court, again, looks at the same standard, whether that foreign guardian is the best, is it in the best interest of the child to, uh, to serve in that role. Um, but when we have a foreign guardian, there are some other uh, issues involved. The court doesn't actually have jurisdiction over this person or they don't really have that much information. And as well, once the guardianship, the guardian is appointed, the court may lose jurisdiction over the child to make sure the child is cared for properly on an ongoing basis. And so the court, before it will appoint a foreign guardian, they will require that a uh, report be submitted to them um, by the child protective services or whatever is the equivalent agency in the foreign country. Um, so the guardian would request some kind of investigation to be done. That agency would determine whether the home was suitable for the child in a safe place, and then they would report back to the U.S. court. The U.S. court, um, in most cases, if it is a close relative, if it is the person named in the will, um, and if the report comes back positively, then they will go ahead and, and uh, appoint the foreign guardian. Um, I will say there is one caveat to that, and that is if the person is in the, the relative, the foreign guardian, is not in a country that has the same kind of legal system as the US, um, meaning that it's not a, West, a country in Western Europe, it's not Canada or Australia, uh, where you have strong protection, legal protections, then the court may be, and there are other countries, that those are just the ones off of the top of my head, um, but there may be issues in appointing that guardian. So for example, um, one client I have, they, uh, their family was from Iran, and I really, it's possible a court would appoint a guardian in Iran, but a U.S. court probably is going to have a lot of reservations about sending a child to Iran to be raised. So, uh, so those are kind of the things. So in most cases, in a lot of uh, countries, it's not going to be a problem, but there could be some instances, depending on the country, where the court is, is, may have a problem with that. Even if the court does end up appointing the foreign guardian, there will definitely be delays. This isn't a process that takes a month, two months, we're talking at least six months to a year. So it's really important to have an alternate uh, or a temporary plan so that somebody is taking care of your children during this time that these guardianship proceedings are taking place because your child will not be able to, uh, to get on a plane and go to this other country. Um, so legally they have to be here um, 
well, whatever guardian is, uh, is, is based here. So the worst case scenario, uh, and this is kind of every parent's nightmare, but it is something we, we just need to be aware of, is that if there is no guardian, uh, even sort of on a temporary basis, then your child could end up in the foster care system and be a, a ward of the state. So that's obviously something we want to make sure we avoid at all costs. And so it's really important to do that planning. So that's how we plan for the guardianship aspect of things. The next section is I'm going to be talking about planning for your assets. Um, and again, here, there could be some wrinkles when we have international issues. So first, I'm just going to talk about the uh, generally how the process works. So when somebody passes away, um, their assets are going to go through uh, what we call probate. Probate is the court process of transferring your assets into the name of your heirs. Um, and the, the probate court uh, appoints an executor to administer and initiate all of that process. Um, the executor is generally would be somebody who is named in your will. Um, and they would be in charge of filing documents with the court, working with the lawyer to make sure filing tax returns, making sure that everything is taken care of properly so that the assets go to the people who you want to, uh, them to go to. The um, executor must be a US citizen or a US resident. And so this can cause some issues if your family members are all overseas, um, having an executor, uh, it, it really needs to be a US citizen or US resident. There are some workarounds to that. You can appoint a co-executor uh, who's in the US to serve along with the foreign executor, but that can get quite costly and administratively cumbersome. So what happens if you don't have a will? If you don't have a will, your assets are distributed uh, pursuant to the laws of the court and or of the state that, that you were living in. And in New York, um, if you're married, 50% of it goes to your spouse and 50% goes to your children. A lot of people aren't aware of that. They think that everything would go to their spouse, but in New York, that's not the case. Um, if there is no surviving spouse, it will go to, everything will go to your children equally. Um, the assets that are left to children, there's always uh, some concern about any assets that are left to children, whether through your will or through, um, if, if there's not a will, then through the default process um, from the state. And the reason is that children who are under the age of 18 are not legally capable of managing their own assets. And for this reason, uh, the court would, anything left to children directly would be administered by um, a guardian of the assets. And this is somebody that the court would appoint to administer the assets until the children turn 18. Um, the guardian of the assets is required to make annual reports to the court on the value of the assets, how and where the, val uh, the assets are held, and what, how the money is being spent. So whatever the money is being spent on for your child, that would go into those reports. And those reports become public information, they're public records. So that's generally not a great arrangement. So we always try to um, avoid that process, sort of that situation from happening. Um, and that's true whether or not you have, you know, we have international families or we have domestic families. Um, that's, that's just not a great situation in any case. So in order to avoid that, and, and I should mention as well, the guardian of the assets cannot as well be a foreign person. So that also has to be a US person. But in order to avoid that process entirely, what we would do is we would set up, leave assets to a trust for the children. Um, the trustee would manage the assets for the children until they reach a certain age. And it eliminates the need for these annual reports to the court. And it also provides protection from creditors. As well, you know, most uh, parents, they don't want their kids to inherit a bunch of money when they turn 18. So uh, 
having the trust in place allows them to designate an age when they would be uh, more likely to make mature judgments about how that money should be spent. So you can see here, this is, uh, I have a structure and I just wanna mention, I do see that there's a question and I'm gonna hold off on those until we get to the end and I'm, then I'll, I'll leave some time for questions. Um, so this is what a basic estate plan would look like in a standard sort of uh, situation. So we might have a will and the will would say, possibly I leave everything to my spouse. And then if, my, if there was a spouse, if there was no spouse, then it would go into a trust for the kids. Or if the spouse had passed away, then it goes into a trust for the kids. Um, in this scenario, the trust is part of your will. And so that as well has to be set up through the probate process. And in this process, of course, again, the court would appoint the executor to administer the will. And the court would also appoint the trustee to administer the trust. And in this case as well, the trustee of the testamentary trust cannot be a foreign person. So that person managing the assets cannot be a foreign person. So that also can provide, can result in some issues if you want a foreign relative to be managing the assets. So here again, you know, these are the pitfalls of probate for international families. The executor cannot be a foreign person and the trustee of a testamentary trust cannot be a foreign person. So what do we do to address these issues so that um, they are not a problem in the planning process? And the answer is that we would set up what we call a revocable living trust. A revocable living trust is something that you set up during your life. It's not like the testamentary trust that I just mentioned, because that trust is only set up upon your death and when the, once your will goes through the court. The living trust is a trust that goes into effect while you're living and it's revocable, meaning that you can change it at any time. Sometimes what we would call this trust is a will substitute. It's a substitute for your will because basically has the same provisions that you would have in your will in the sense that it says who your assets and how your assets should be left, but it doesn't go through the court process. So that's the main benefit of having this trust. Um, the other benefit is that you can appoint any uh, person outside of the U.S. to manage your assets. So uh, you would be the trustee during your life and managing the assets. And then when you pass away, there's a successor trustee that's named in your trust, and that person takes over management of the assets. And that can be anybody. You can appoint anybody. You have total flexibility. So um, you can appoint somebody who is outside of the U.S. to administer the assets. And this is also a way um, that person, that trustee, also plays the role of the executor. Um, so even though they don't have to report to the court, that trustee is responsible for making sure that your assets get to the people who are supposed to get, the, uh, supposed to get them and also filing any kind of uh, paperwork or tax returns, then the trustee is responsible for doing that. But you can have a foreign person be serve in that role. This, the trust also allows, because it doesn't go through the court, allows for a faster, cheaper, more efficient administration of your estate. And so for this reason, a lot of uh, people, a lot of my clients, even who don't have any kind of international issues, they will still opt to do a living trust because it does make that process a lot smoother. And this is kind of what that looks like. You have a living trust and then um, the trust, when you pass away, anything that goes to your kids, it would be held in further trust uh, for, the, uh, for the benefit of your kids. And the trustee would continue to manage the assets until the kids reached a certain age. Um, even when you have a living trust, you still have a will. We still do a will just in case. One, it has the guardianship provisions. And two, if there was anything that's left outside of the trust, then that will sort of catch those assets and put them into the trust. But it's really important. So one of the catches to having the living trust is that the assets have to be transferred into the trust during your life or left to the trust through some kind of beneficiary designation in order to avoid the, the probate process. So it's not as simple as a will. Where a will just says everything I own and everything you own just goes to where the will says. In a trust, you have to make sure those assets are directed to the trust, otherwise they are not included and they would not avoid the probate process. 
Um, the, uh, the last part of the estate planning, or one of the last parts of the estate planning process uh, is that I'll talk about is incapacity planning. So we talked about taking care of your child, we talked about taking care of your assets, and now we're talking about taking care of you. If something happens to you, you're still alive, but you're in the hospital, you're on a respirator, um, you're not able to do all of the things that you need to do to make decisions for yourself legally, perhaps you're sedated, um, you're not able to access your bank accounts, particularly during this time where um, we have the, the pandemic, oops, <laughs> where we have the pandemic, um, you know, you, you can't even, a lot of times you're not even able to bring your phone into the room. So it's important that someone is able to be able to pay any bills. So if your rent needs to be paid, your mortgage needs to be paid, any uh, expenses for your kids. So especially if you have people who are relying on you um, to provide, to pay for anything, then it's really important that somebody else is able to access your assets to be able to pay those expenses. And we do that in a document that's called a power of attorney. Um, the other document, another document that we put in place to uh, plan for incapacity is a healthcare proxy. So authorizing someone to make medical decisions for you if you weren't able to make those medical decisions yourself. Uh, finally, a standby guardian. This as well, so the guardian in your will only goes into effect after your will is probated and the court appoints that guardian. A standby guardian, um, we can appoint somebody in advance so they could serve as a temporary guardian if you became incapacitated. So the important just to review, the important estate documents that we generally would put in place would be a will, your living trust, a power of attorney, your healthcare proxy, a standby guardianship. And those are the documents that we would have in the US. There may be other documents, but they, you know, in different situations, but those are, are the, the main documents. Um, I'll also add that if you have assets outside of the US, we need to plan for those separately. So you don't want a US will trying to be admitted to a court, say in France, that's going to cause a lot of problems. So generally what I would recommend is that you have um, a separate plan for your assets in the other country. Um, particularly if it's real estate, that's going to be governed by the law where, um, where the, the assets are located. So we want to make sure that we're working with an attorney in that country um, to plan for that asset. And it's also important for the attorneys in the U.S. and the attorney in that foreign country to work together to make sure because uh, what we don't want to happen is that we have two conflicting wills or we have two wills and in the US you can only have one will. So we wanna make sure that those uh, documents are coordinated and that it's not adversely affecting the other, the plan in the other country. Um, so what I just talked about mostly applies for um, anyone who is residing here in the US permanently. So um, if you're a permanent resident or you're planning to stay here permanently, maybe you're in the process of getting a green card uh, or you're planning to, get, to apply for a green card, then um, the, uh, then that, that's, those are sort of the, that's the process that would go into effect in terms of, um, in terms of, it, of your estate plan. If you have a temporary visa and you're here on a work visa, but you're planning to return to your home country, then there are some other documents. We, we don't necessarily need all of those documents that I just talked about, but we do need some of them. Um, so we still want a US guardianship documentation. Uh, if something happened to you, we wanna make sure that your children um, have a guardianship documentation in place, both for the foreign guardian and um, any temporary guardian in the US. Uh, we also want to have a US power of attorney for any assets or anything that needs to be managed here while you're in the US and also a healthcare proxy if you were to get sick here and needed someone to make medical decisions for you. Also, if you have assets in the US, you wanna make sure that you have some kind of plan 
for your US assets. Um, so if you don't have assets in the US and you are here on a temporary visa, your primary um, estate proceeding is going to be in your home country. And so if you don't have any assets in the US, then we don't even necessarily need to do much asset planning for, for your, your situation. Um, and then as well in this situation, you wanna coordinate with the, the attorney in your home country. Okay, um, now is onto the fun part of estate taxes. For estate taxes, um, these, this can definitely cause a lot of complications, um, but in some situations, it's, it's really not much of an issue at all. But it's really important to understand uh, what the different rules are and how they might apply to you. So there are two categories of taxpayers for um, the purposes of U.S. estate taxes. And I just want to caveat that the estate tax is separate from the income tax. So there's no, um, so this is kind of a completely different set of rules. So anything that you know about the income taxes, it doesn't necessarily apply here. So here we have two categories of taxpayers. We have U.S. citizens and immigrants who are domiciled in the U.S. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. And then the second category is non-citizens who are domiciled outside of the U.S. So, of course, your question, I'm sure, is what is a domicile? Because that's not a term that we use in most cases. It's sort of something that is very specific to the legal world. Um, domicile is the place where you call home, basically. So um, the definition of domicile is the place where you live without any intention of leaving. So if you're here on a green card, then uh, by the terms of your green card, you must intend to stay in the United States for indefinitely. Um, and then if you're here on a work visa, then you, um, then a lot of times the terms of that visa are that you have to intend to return to your home country. Um, and various visas have different conditions. Um, an H-1B visa, you may be able to intend to stay here and apply for a green card. Other types of visas, you can only, they're only for a limited period of time and you must go back. Uh, it's really important to understand that the domicile, the concept of domicile is not the same I know it sounds like residence, but it's not the same as residence for U.S. income tax purposes. So for U.S. income tax purposes, there are very clear rules. If you're here in the U.S. for a certain amount of time, you're a U.S. income tax resident. Those rules don't apply to at the estate tax uh, arena. This is solely based on your domicile and also on your citizenship. If you are a U.S. citizen, um, like I said, that's you are, do fall into the first category of taxpayers, regardless of whether, where you are living or where you are domiciled. So what I think of it as to sort of, I know that domicile can be sort of an um, abstruse term. Uh, we'll just think of it as US citizens and permanent residents, and then um, non-citizens who are not US residents. And so, uh, that just sort of makes the terminology, I feel like, a little bit easier. But just understand that permanent resident, I'm not talking about necessarily a green card. I'm talking about somebody who's planning on staying here permanently. So if you are a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, then there is an estate a ta a ta a tax that's applied to the value of your estate. Um, the value of your estate is your, the value of your worldwide assets minus any liabilities, and then plus any life insurance proceeds. Um, so it's really important to understand that, to remember that if you have assets outside of the U.S., if you have real estate outside of the U.S., all of that is counted in the value of your estate when we're calculating your estate tax. Um, the good thing about the estate tax is there is a fairly large exemption. The exemption for New York State is $6 million um, at the federal level. It's currently $12 million, but it's going to be going back to $6 million in a few years, if not before then. So at the federal level, it's always a moving target, but um, you could think of it as somewhere around $6 million. So, you know, a lot of people, this isn't going, even going to apply to them because a lot of people don't have $6 million, 
but I will say you definitely want to make sure that you include the value of your life insurance proceeds because often that's especially when we have young kids with families with young kids that's what kind of pushes them onto the estate tax um, being subject to the estate tax the tax is quite high it's 40 percent so once you do go over that six million dollars um, the amount that's over the six million dollars is subject to estate tax uh, for new york state the tax is lower but the as the tax applies to your entire estate. So sometimes you can actually have a higher tax in New York state um, than you have for the, um, the, at the federal level. There are minor differences between the estate tax as it applies to US citizens and as it applies to permanent residents. So you might've heard of, you know, if you have a spouse who's not a citizen, then there could be some tax issues. That's true, but you still get to leave them $6 million. And if they are a permanent resident, they still get to leave you $6 million. So it's often not as big of an issue as people may, um, may think it is. And there are also some other minor differences, but for the most part, these general rules are going to apply. Even if you do have an estate tax, even if you do have over $6 million, there are a number of ways that we can uh, plan your assets to try to minimize that. Um, so even if you are subject to the estate tax, you know, keep in mind that there are a lot of uh, planning options for you. So if you're not a US citizen and you, are, you live outside of the US, you're resident outside of the US, then there is a different set of rules. So, the value of your estate for U.S. estate tax purposes is just your U.S. assets. So you're not taxed on anything outside of the U.S. You're only taxed on your U.S. assets. So that would include U.S. real estate, stocks, partnerships, um, any artwork, any, uh, any jewelry, anything that's located in the U.S. would be considered a U.S. asset. The kicker for this is that the estate tax exemption is super low. So it's only actually 1% of the estate tax exemption that US citizens and, and US residents get. It's only $60,000. So that really applies to almost anybody unless you have like a you know, sort of like a de minimis amount in an account here, um, you're going to be subject to the estate tax. And again, that's a pretty high rate. It's a 40% on anything over the $60,000. At the New York level, um, there is no corollary to this. So you still have the $6 million exemption, but at the federal level, this can cause a lot of problems. So some examples of how this can kind of really affect people and them not being aware of it. Uh, so sometimes I'll have uh, someone here who they're here on a work visa and maybe they decide to buy an apartment they're living here and they figure they'll keep it for investment purposes after they leave um, if you again if you are here on a temporary visa and you plan to go back to your home country then that's going to be subject to the estate tax um, so you only have a sixty thousand dollar exemption and we know that doesn't buy much of anything in new york city so your, your family is going to be left with a pretty hefty tax um, another example, so I, I do see these a lot and they're really frustrating because they're simple to avoid if you just know the rules. So, but I, if you don't know the rules and, you know, you take a misstep, you buy something and then if, if you pass away, then your family is like, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea. And probably they had no idea. And then it's really can be too late to fix it. Um, so another example is a, a client who is here in the U.S. Um, her, she's uh, originally from China, but she's a, a U.S. citizen now. Her mother in China helps her to purchase her house for a million dollars. So her mother is on the deed. They own it jointly. If the mother passes away, there's going to be a tax on that house. So it's going to be 40% um, of half of it minus the, the $60,000. So you're looking at a pretty significant tax. Another example might be uh, maybe 
a father who is in Hong Kong. He opens a joint account, bank account with his wife, um, who is also in Hong Kong. And they open a, an account in the US because they uh, feel like the, the US is a more stable place to put their money. And also maybe they have adult children here, so they have connection here in the US. The father passes away, and now there is a tax when it goes to his wife. So, um, so these are examples of just simple, and they don't need to be enormous numbers to have a, a really big effect on the, have end up with a really big tax bill. So this is just a little uh, cartoon that I have here of, you know, there's no getting away from you guys. Like you, you, wherever you are, if you have any kind of connection with the US, you really have to be concerned about, um, be cognizant of any tax rules. There are also some tax traps for US residents. Um, and this is, this can be common issues if you come to the US. Um, and even if you're just a US resident for income tax purposes, meaning you're not planning on staying here. For the long term. If you own foreign mutual funds or if you have private investments overseas, so if you have you know, partnership interests, uh, real estate interests overseas and they're generating income, um, then there could be some income tax, sort of very punitive income tax implications on that. So you want to make sure you're working with a tax, um, a tax professional and preferably somebody who does a lot of international work to avoid um, any kind of adverse penalties. Um, failure to report foreign bank accounts, that was a big problem at, at one point. The rules are still in place, and so it is a very high penalty if you don't report them. I think we're seeing a lot more awareness that if you do have any foreign bank accounts, and I think that the threshold is over 10,000, so it's quite low, um, you, you want to make sure that you uh, file those FBARs because that's something that could just end up in very steep penalties. And it's not even a tax that you have to pay. You just have to make that filing. The same will go for um, if you're receiving a gift or inheritance from a foreign person, there's no tax on that, but you have to report it. So you have to report anything that's over $100,000 um, and in some cases less. So you want to make sure that you um, you report any gifts or inheritance because even though there's no tax, you could end up having a lot of penalties for failure to report. Okay, so um, that covers a lot of the estate planning, but I also wanted to address the issue of expatriation because many clients, um, maybe they're dual citizens or you know they're here on a green card and they're thinking, well, maybe they will go back to their home country at some point. And so um, we need to be aware of the expatriation laws. Um, expatriation means you are giving up your citizenship or you're giving up your green card. So giving up your US citizenship is quite rare, but it's not so um, uncommon to give up your green card. And even if you, you can also just lose your green card in various scenarios if you live outside of the US for too long, then your green card can be deemed to be abandoned. Um, and so that would be considered to be uh, expatriation as well. So these particular rules, um, these taxes, applied to what we call covered expatriates. Um, covered expatriates means that you satisfy two different prongs to, to, to be an expatriate, covered expatriate. One is that you abandon your US citizenship or you abandon your green card after you've held it for more than seven years. Um, and so that sort of giving up the green card, that's something that a lot of times people will, will have an issue with because they hadn't become a citizen and so when they decide to go back to their home country, they give up the green card, and then this could trigger this covered expatriate status. So it's also, um, so if you are relinquishing your citizenship or you are relinquishing your green card after being here for more than seven years, um, this covered expatriate status still only applies if you have to have um, satisfy this income or net worth test. So if you have assets of greater than $2 million, then um, that triggers covered expatriate status. Or the other thing is you can, um, if you have 
average annual income tax liability over the last five years of more than $160,000, and that's at the federal level, um, then you would satisfy this um, income or this financial prong of the test. And then the finally, if you do relinquish your green card and you fail to certify US tax compliance for the previous five years, um, and so that's a, basically you, you would fill out a form when you relinquish your green card, a tax form um, certifying your tax compliance and confirming your expatriation, you could also be considered a covered expatriate. So what is the implication of being a covered expatriate? You would be subject to an exit tax. So um, the exit tax is, it's basically an accelerated tax on any capital gains that may have accrued on assets while you were in the US. Um, there is a pretty decent size exclusion. There is a $700,000, about a $700,000 exclusion um, on any capital gain. So only if you have any gain above that amount would you have to pay that accelerated tax. Um, it also accelerates tax on any IRAs. Uh, so basically it deems that they're withdrawn all in that same year you're, you're expatriating and any 529 accounts and certain other tax deferred accounts, it assumes that all of those are withdrawn in that same year. So that can result in a pretty high tax bill if you uh, have all of that income coming in at the same year. The other implication of covered expatriates is um, a 40% tax on all gifts and bequests to US citizens and US residents. So this often has a much bigger impact on um, expatriates than the exit tax does. So if you have often, you might be here for a long period of time, your children were born here and so they're US citizens. So if you pass away, whatever goes to your kids as US citizens or US, uh, they have green card, US residents, um, then they are, will have to pay a 40% tax on anything that comes from you, regardless of whether it's a US asset, whether it's a foreign asset, whether you um, have obtained it before, you purchased it before you, um, you expatriated or after you left the country, anything that goes to US citizens or US residents is going to be subject to that inheritance tax. So that's often the um, much more so than the exit tax, what will factor into a decision whether or not to expatriate. So sometimes what people do if they want to go back to their, uh, their home country and they've been here for a long period of time, they'll apply for citizenship because it's actually better for, a tax, um, for tax purposes as long as you're not going to a lower tax jurisdiction. Um, okay, uh, so that pretty much covers uh, what I wanted to present today. Um, you, this is uh, where I work, Office of Shannon McNulty, my, my website you have there. I'm also, um, anybody who's on the, uh, the call today, you are welcome to come in for a presentation, uh, or I'm sorry, a, not a presentation, just had a presentation, or a consultation. Um, and I'm gonna put the link to that if I can, let's see if I can uh, put that in the chat box here. So I'm going to see if uh, Lee is my assistant, so if she can put that in the chat box for um, a consultation for a, a legal planning session. Um, so if she can't do that, and then I'll, I'll get to it. But I'm going to answer, get to these uh, Q&As. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, we have a guardian for our child written into our UK wills. How do we express our intentions? for a foreign guardian since this isn't written to our wills currently? Um, that's a good question. And for guardianship purposes, if you don't, if it's hard to tell exactly what the situation is, but if you have a US will and you don't have any kind of guardianship documentation in that, I would recommend that you insert that into your wills, that you have your wills redone and you would put that in place. Um, that, however, a UK will can be admitted for purposes of guardianship 
um, in the US. Uh, but I would, especially if you are here permanently, if you're a permanent resident, I would have um, your US wills uh, incorporate your guardianship intentions. And also I would definitely have a standby guardianship which would allow somebody here in the US to, um, to take care of your kids pending any kind of foreign guardian appointment. Okay, the next um, question. Would love to know the differences there may be, if anything, to this guidance if a family is living in the US under diplomatic visas. Um, yeah, there there are some differences, uh, and generally it's because you are not considered. If you do have a diplomatic visa, you are not considered uh, as a U.S. domiciled. You're not considered a permanent resident um, unless, for some other reason, you are. So, if you're planning on getting a green card, or if you're in the process of getting a green card, then you could still be um, a, a U.S. resident for estate tax purposes. However, um, in most cases, you will be considered to be domiciled outside of the U.S., meaning that those sort of more, those stricter estate tax laws apply. Um, and I would also make sure that you have the guardianship uh, documentation in place. So probably the same kind of planning that I would do if you were here on like a temporary work visa. Um, I know there are specific exemptions for income taxes, but those do not generally apply for estate tax purposes unless it's uh, indicated in some kind of treaty. <coughs> so I think we've addressed any questions. Um, we do have, if you can see it in the chat box, there is a link there. If you do want to go ahead and schedule a consultation, um, I would love to talk to you about your individual situation, your individual circumstances. Um, and that's, that's our presentation for today. So I, I hope it was helpful and I'd love to hear your feedback as well. Um, so we'll be sending an email out and if you have uh, any feedback on the presentation of if it, whether it was helpful, whether there were things that um, additional things that you wish that that were covered, that would be really helpful for us uh, in the future. Okay, uh, everybody has a great day and we will we will see you soon.